of angels. Jesus Christ is risen. Please join me in the prayer of adoration. 
Glory to you, O God, on this day you won victory over death, raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, O Christ, for us and for our salvation, you overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life. Glory to you, O Holy Spirit, you lead us into the truth. Glory to you, O Blessed Trinity, now and forever. Amen. The Lord says, Come, let anyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift, trusting in God's grace. Let us confess our sin. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. sheep have gone astray but now we have returned to the shepherd and guardian of our souls in the name of Jesus Christ we are forgiven thanks be to God amen let us pray living God with joy we celebrate the presence of your risen word enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, Anyone who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to God. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of God for the people of God.
Easter Sunday is the 20th chapter of John. I'll be reading the first 18 verses. Listen for the word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know what it, that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had, he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When have you been encouraged by someone? People who encourage us, help us to uh, live this life, even in the midst of our struggles. Just this week, I received a very encouraging note from Emily. In the note, she says, Dear Reverend Anne, you are the best. I love you so much. I am so sad that I cannot see you. I guess I wanted to say thank you. Love, Emily. I was so encouraged by that note. And today I decided to wear the scarf that Emily and her brother and sisters gave me last year for Easter. It has, as you can see, butterflies in it. And that is a wonderful symbol for Easter. I also remember receiving a shell that I have in my office, and on it is etched the Lord's Prayer from Maya and Ava. Our children 
have encouraged me along the way, as has this congregation. I wonder who has encouraged you in your life, but maybe lately we all need encouragement during this particular time. In 1903, a young man, not yet 20, was studying to become an officer at a military academy and found himself overwhelmed with uncertainty. He was uncomfortable in the military and also with the anticipation of taking life. He preferred to spend his time reading and writing poetry. One day, sitting under a tree engrossed in the work of a favorite poet, the chaplain of the school came to sit with him and looked at the book of poetry and realized the author had been one of his own students at another military academy earlier in his life. He told the young man about the poet's life and he decided, the young man did, to write the hero and to ask him some questions he was really contemplating. He wanted to know if he should become an officer in the military or could it be possible that he was a, uh, enough of a poet to be able to write poetry for a living. It was at this juncture that the great poet Maria Rayner Rilke began correspondence. Upon Rilke's death, the letters were published in a book, Letters to a Young Poet. What is extraordinary about the correspondence is that while Rilke was unafraid to be honest, for instance, in his first letter, he wrote, let me only tell you further that your verses have no individual style. He never ceases to be encouraging, gracious, and generous. Even when Mr. Frank Kappas took a four-year hi hiatus in correspondence, Rilke maintained generous, encouraging, and inspiring support. He also learned that Kappas had become an officer after all. When the young poet what the young poet didn't know was that Rilke's life was a real struggle. He had little income from his poetry. He lived a life of poverty. He and his wife moved from place to place and they had to send their daughter to her grandparents' home. They stayed in tiny hostel rooms or in the homes of patrons and friends. He was often ill and depressed by the cities in which he found himself. The cities had the climate that he didn't like and the scents and smells of the city he didn't like as well as the crowds. Yet all this time, the seasoned poet never let on, maintaining a generous and supportive correspondence with Mr. Kappas. We seem to think that God works best in our lives when we are strong, healthy, easygoing, and not anxious about money. As if God only works for the great, the powerful, and the good. However, the history of faith tells us differently. God works in the lives of the broken and damaged. In fact, it is in the midst of struggle that God is most at home and most powerfully at work. For instance, God chose an abused and geopolitically insignificant people as God's own, saving them from slavery by way of Moses, who himself was a fugitive and a murderer. He was the one chosen to transport God's law from the mountain with the commandment, thou shalt not kill. God worked in the life of David, an adulterer and also a murderer, who grew to be the greatest king of Israel. He wrote psalms of faithfulness and intense personal uh, confessions. God worked in the life of the Apostle Paul, who had been a violent and vigorous persecutor of early Christians. Paul had a lifelong affliction, a thorn in his flesh. It kept him humble as he became a skillful missionary, spreading the love of Christ in the new world. Why do we only think God works when things are going well for us? The truth is God works when we are suffering, isolated, 
and in trouble. In fact, it is in the deepest suffering at the heart of dark darkness that the resurrection happens. It is hard for us now to hear the Gospel of John as those first generation Christians did, to understand what it was like to be there as the narrative unfolded. As a literary artist, John sanitized the horrors of crucifixion. When we hear the details, we don't fill in the pain and suffering, but John's early listeners did. They knew these hardships intimately. For example, I imagine if I begin a story about a big city and twin towers, you could possibly fill in the details. Many would remember the scenes as if it was yesterday. We need hardly more than the barest reference to make the story come alive in our minds. The same was true for the early readers of the Gospels. The details aren't there because they didn't need to be. Crucifixion was Rome's favorite tactic of state terrorism. Thousands of people were publicly crucified every year. All of John's early readers would have seen crucifixions and been traumatized by them. There was violence attached to every detail that John recalls. Sights they had witnessed, sounds they could not unhear, memories of friends, family or acquaintances killed in the same way, the grief and fear that rose before their eyes at just the merest word. So likewise, we don't feel the fear that rose up in Mary Magdalene when she thought the Romans had taken the body of Jesus. We don't feel the shudder run through our bodies or the bile come up in our throats. Had they taken their beloved rabbi's body where it could be defiled by animals? It was the worst sacrilege imaginable, a revulsion the Romans often employed to further shock and terrorize. Here is Mary, overwhelmed with grief and shock now pleading with the gardener to tell her where she could find the rabbi's body. And it is right here at the deepest moment of her suffering, when things could hardly get any worse, that the resurrection happens. She hears the voice she thought she'd never hear again speaking her name. When we separate the joy of resurrection from the pain of crucifixion, we miss out on the truth God revealed that nothing can separate us from God's love in Jesus Christ. Not the deepest pain or the worst trauma, the darkest depression, the most desperate sin, not hardship or addiction or death, not even a novel virus wreaking havoc in the world. Christ is with us through it all. Suffering can do nothing to stop God's longing for us. God is determined to offer new life and does so graciously in the darkest moments of our lives. Christ is with us, weeping with us, suffering with us, and yet is eternally undiminished in hope for us. It is this resurrection hope that sets Mary on fire for her faith. She becomes a leader and models that which has sustained Christians through enormous struggles over the centuries. The Reverend Tom R. remembers eating dinner with his brother, Gene. Gene was born a special needs kid. At 57, he thinks like a five-year-old. He loves to watch reruns of Chips and Emergency. He loves when I tell the congregation about him, R. says. He knows my name, but he calls me Buada. His dream is to drive a car. A red one is preferable. At 57 years old, he just wants to drive. We were eating at his favorite restaurant, Shoney's Big Boy. Do you know that one? We ordered the cholesterol plate. We were talking about the trips he would take when he got his red car. I'll never forget this moment. He asked me, what a do you think I'll ever drive a car? Yes, Jean, yes I do. Now I know he will never drive a car, but that's not what he was asking me, not really. He was asking me, will there ever be a day 
when all that has gone wrong will be made right? Will there ever be a day when everything that has fallen apart will be put together? And will there ever be a day when God will repair that which we cannot heal? Tom said, I said yes. God will do for you and for me and for us, for all. Because the love of God witnessed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a transforming love that will never let us go. And we will not simply live with God. We will be who God created us to be. I invite you to see yourselves as God sees you. People full of resilience and possibility. And yes, yes, I do believe someday that we will all drive a red car. To God be the glory. in Christ, let us say what we believe. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter and to the twelve and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the
belong to Jesus Christ. All things are his, for he is Lord of all. In his generosity is the gift of ours. I invite you to make your offering this morning, either by going to our website and clicking there on um, the place where you can donate online, or to send your check-in uh, by mail. We are also receiving the One Great Hour of Sharing uh, offering this Easter Sunday, and we invite you to give to that uh, as you can. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and north and south to sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's table. It's not the table of our denomination or of this particular church. All who trust Christ are welcome to partake of the meal he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. At your word, the earth was made and spun on its course among the planets. Your hand formed us from the dust of the earth and set us among your creatures to love and serve you. When we were unfaithful to you, you kept faith with us. Your love remained steadfast. And when we were slaves in Egypt, you brought broke the bonds of our oppression, brought us through to the sea of freedom, and made covenant to be our God. By a pillar of fire you led us through the desert to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. You spoke of love and justice in the prophets. And in the word made flesh, you lived among us, manifesting your glory. He died that we might live, and is risen to raise us to new life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the angels and archangels, and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to save us. He came with healing in his touch and was wounded for our sins. He came with mercy in his voice and was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and death. By your power he broke free from the prison of the tomb and at his command, the gates of hell were opened. The one who is dead now lives. The one who was humbled himself is raised to rule over all creation. The lamb upon the throne, the one ascended on high is with us always as he promised. And remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. And in this silence, gracious God, hear the prayers of our hearts for your world.
nourished at this table, O God, may we know Christ's redemptive love and live a new life in him. Help us who recognize our Lord in the breaking of bread to see and serve him in all whose lives are broken. Give us who are fed at his hand grace to share our bread with the hungry and with the hungry of heart. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. And let us pray with the confidence of the people of God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink it, remember me. For every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And friends, he will surely come again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray together the prayer after communion. Here at this table, we celebrate resurrection as you feed us with bread and wine. And as much as we might prefer to stay here in this protected place, you will eventually send us back to our work. Only it is no longer the same work because we know you are with us and in us, shaping and transforming us to be your witnesses in the world. Nourished in body, mind, and spirit, may all that we do, say and do, O oh God, give you glory. Amen.
And now may the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate company of the Holy Spirit be and abide with each one of you now and forevermore. Amen.